Good morning and welcome to another Zido webinar. My name is Taylor and I'm the Digital Marketing Coordinator here at Zido. Today we're happy to hear from Vonda Flew, who is going to be speaking about a new year, a new you. A little bit about Vonda Flew. She is an occupational therapist, certified aroma freedom technique practitioner, works in physical and mental health fields, health and wellness educator, holistic health advocate who focuses on physical, emotional, and spiritual healing. And without further ado, let's hear from Vonda. Hello, my name is Vonda Flew, and I am here to talk to you about 2021. As we enter the new year, some of us may not have the same outlook that we typically have on a new year. 2020 brought some major changes into our lives. Many of us had our routines and habits significantly altered or maybe halted altogether. As an occupational therapist, my job is to help people who struggle with either physical or mental struggles and to help them when the typical path is not available. I think that's what 2020 brought us. What I would like to present you with today is activities and actions and some things that are probably right at your fingertips that you can do to be more proactive and productive in 2021, even if some of the changes and some of the things that are um, different and that came upon us in 2020 are still there. Many times we were just getting used to the changes of 2020 when some new change would come along or something would come back in. But if there are things that you can do that you can take control of, things that, like I said, in your environment are probably right around you that you may not even realize. What are these activities and actions? I call these the forgotten healers. There are things that have proven healing and restorative benefits. At the end of this webinar, I would like to present tools on how to implement these forgotten healers. Because as an occupational therapist, I know that I can give lots of suggestions, but you have to fit it, or sometimes me and my patient have to fit it into their lifestyle, into their culture. And so I'm gonna give you some suggestions at the end on how to hopefully successfully do that. I want to read this disclaimer. I am not treating nor am I prescribing anything in today's webinar. I am just sharing overall general wellness tips. It is your responsibility to check with your physician or healthcare provider to see if any of the activities are safe for you to implement. With that, I wanted to get us to the first forgotten healer, which is nutrition. Now, none of these are in a specific order. It's not like nutrition is the most important forgotten healer, um, but they're just in orders that I thought of. In 2020, I heard something quite often. It was called the quarantine 15. And although that may rhyme nicely, I'm not sure that feels very nice. Unfortunately, during stressful times, we tend to gravitate toward things that are like simple carbohydrates, um, starches, simple sugars, caffeine, they are quick energy sources because we feel the stress and our body feels the stress. So it wants energy and it wants a quick energy source so it can go with fight or flight, whether it has to fight or it has to flee. Unfortunately, many of us moved less in 2020 with more stress and hence the quarantine 15. So our body was preparing and needing energy for fighting, fighting or fleeing, but we didn't do any. Many times when we are eating those foods that are simple carbohydrates, simple sugars, um, they're devoid of nutrients. And then we don't burn off those things. So yes, we have the calories, but it also messes up with our sleep. Then unfortunately, we don't have good sleep. And then the next day we have to get up and face the day. We have to do our work or our school um, and we are not ready. We're not prepared. We don't have resources. When we sleep, our body repairs and restores and we didn't give it nutrients the night before. So unfortunately, many of us reach for that same stuff of caffeine, simple carbohydrates, simple sugars. And it just creates a vicious cycle. Our body really needs nutrients. Food is a forgotten healer. We may eat something and feel full, but it doesn't give us the nutrients that we need. The first step in helping us with nutrition is taking control of what you eat, but it starts with what you buy. Now, don't go to the store hungry. We all know that. But 
go and find good quality food, food that is full of fiber as well, you know, oats and grains, not simple sugars, quite the opposite, because it takes your body longer to break those things down, so it gives you, uh, you're feeling fuller longer. And this is what people tell me. Sometimes they say, hey, that stuff's expensive. I don't think I can buy it. And this is what I, and this is how I explain it. Um, I understand that, yes, the sticker shock sometimes is quite a shock, but what actually happens is, is when you eat food that is full of nutrients, it's dense in fiber, then you actually don't eat as much. When you eat the food that is less, well, more refined, um, more processed, is devoid of nutrients, then your body's still hungry. So it sends you back to the pantry and the refrigerator a lot more often. So you're consuming more food, but you're not getting nutrients. So you're buying more food. So your bill is higher. Whereas on the other side, you're buying less food. Yes, your bill is maybe the same amount, but you get nutrients. You're not eating as often. It was a surprise when we found that out. I found that in my household. I wasn't going back to the pantry or the refrigerator as often, and I munched a lot in my life. So that's one way to look at that situation. And also remember, I read two books on water, and um, what they said was is we mistake a lot of times our feelings of being hungry, um, and our body is really trying to tell us it's thirsty. Our body needs a lot of water. We can go a lot longer without food than we can without water. And so we usually are so hungry all the time, we're used to the signal that we need more, um, that we need more food, but we're not used to the signal that we need more water until sometimes it's too late and we're very, very dehydrated. So a lot of times to help with nutrition and eating food when you just want you know, something to eat on, you just maybe take a glass of water and start with that and then evaluate what have I eaten? Is it full of nutrients? Nutrition also impacts our emotions. There's a commercial that says you're not yourself when you're hungry and the concept is true. Nutrition can imp impact our emotions because you tend to be a little bit more irritable. You don't have the resources to face another task that someone may present you with. Or when your task isn't going well, you don't have the resources that you feel like you can push through and go any longer because you need those nutrients. So your mental health is affected just as much as your physical health when you're devoid of nutrients. When you have those good nutrients in your body, you should feel good and creative. You're mentally, you feel good. And you should, you should wanna move. You should wanna push forward and finish the task. Which lead, leads me, which leads me to the second forgotten healer, moving and dancing. When you have good nutrition, you want to move. You are okay with moving. If you wanted to add in just five minutes in your day of breathing, just go sit down and just breathe deeply like you can, much as you can for five minutes. It's hard. I tried to do it and um, the other day just to practice because I put this in here and I'd watched a talk on it. And I found myself wanting to get up and do something. And I said, no, stop and sit here for five minutes and do this. The interesting thing that happened was about two, two and a half minutes in, I was practicing deep breathing, but my body spontaneously took this wonderful deep breath. It was not like the ones I'd been practicing. It was great. And then I went back and started doing my deep breathing again, listening to the person talk about their various things, and my body did it again at about two minutes later. Spontaneous good deep breath. If we practice that often, then our bodies would be used to that. And then when we wanted to call upon it during times of heightened stress, our bodies would say, I know what to do. I know what that's like. Our fifth forgotten healer is laughter. If you think about we all pretty much understand that negative thoughts and stress affects us negatively. We know that negative thoughts manifest into chemicals that can affect your body. It can bring more stress and it can lower your immunity. We all know that when we tell people you're burning the candles at both ends, you're going to get sick, you know, because we, that's kind of something that happens that typically happens when we're, we're going from one task fast to the other and, and we just are stressed and depleting our resources. Whereas positive thoughts can actually release neuropeptides that fight stress and it fights more potentially serious illnesses. 
If we believe that the negative can bring us down, those negative mindset and thoughts, then positive can bring us up and laughter takes that positive thoughts to a different level. Um, Laughter reduces stress levels, reduces pain levels, reduces blood pressure. It's, you know, as we just talked about, boosts immunity, your antibodies and your T cells. Laughing hysterically, one study said, releases endorphins um, and positive psychological mood states. Your body also moves with laughter. Think about Jolly St. Nick. Ho, ho, ho. But, you know, he's moving and he's laughing and everything's his shoulders. And that's, again, where we hold a lot of stress. But isn't it interesting to see people who laugh freely and their body moves with it? I think it's really neat to watch. But those muscular actions in the act of laughing, they say actually burns calories. Well, that's an extra caveat for you. But laughter is also contagious. I know that so many times my dad would be laughing at something, a movie theater or something else, and we'd get to laughing because he just kept laughing and he's thinking something's hilariously funny and he's just laughing. And then you're laughing more and more as he continues to laugh. I think it's great because laughter is contagious. You know, those negative thoughts and that complaining can be contagious. Why don't we use something like laughter to be contagious? And they say that the effects, the physical effects of laughter can last up to 45 minutes. Some studies say an hour. That's great. That's like a good exercise or jogs. Not the same, but I thought this one study was great. It said they experimented with the electrical activity that occurs when we laugh. (laughs) Listen to this, about four tenths of a second after we hear the punchline of a joke. Four tenths, before we even laugh, when we hear the punchline, A wave of electricity sweeps through the cortex. This is from the College of William and Mary. He says, what Dirks, the the person who did the study, finds most significant about this wave is that it carpets our entire cerebral cortex rather than just one region. So all or most of our higher brain may play a role in laughter. Perhaps with the left hemisphere working on the joke's verbal content, while the analytic right hemisphere attempts to figure out the incongruity that lies at the heart of much humor. So it stimulates brain function. I mean, think about it. You're trying to figure out the joke. You're trying to remember the joke if it was funny, so you can tell it again. You're trying to figure out why someone didn't get the joke. You're trying to figure out why that person told that joke at this moment or why they told a corny joke. They never tell jokes that are corny like that. I did that the other day and they were looking at me like I was from Mars. They were laughing so much at these corny jokes. That's not the typical things that I do. But even on a, um, this, even if a friend tells a joke to you during a hard time, and sometimes we can do that, and I'm not saying be inappropriate, but sometimes laughter is the best medicine. And sometimes we maybe just need a new perspective on the situation that we're going through. And even when our friend is telling us a joke and it's not funny or it's corny, we know what they're doing. They're, they're trying to help us. We know that instinctively. Even like I say, if the joke was not even a funny joke or something, because that leads me into the next forgotten healer, which is friendship and camaraderie. Friendship is probably a forgotten healer for most people until it's gone. My husband and I went through a lot of medical things for him several years ago, and we ended up going into more holistic um, uh, medicine and looking at things and um, had a new friend set that came out of that. And that was, looking back especially, that was one of the best gifts I could have received. I think that provided enormous healing benefits that I probably to this day don't even recognize. I do the more I study these things like like this talk um, when I looked up things, but just to have someone there, someone to share life experiences with is healing. Someone to talk to, even if they don't have a solution, presence trumps solutions. Just having someone there. In those life experiences, things invariably happen. Even maybe things that aren't funny at the time. Like you're traveling to go somewhere and you have a flat tire. And then it's raining. And then you can't get to the shop and you have to get a motel room. And then you miss the the activities of that first day. None of that seems really fun while it's happening. But if that friendship continues, and hopefully it does, then later on, months, probably years later, 
you look back and you laugh at those things. And you learn about the person in the good and the bad times and you just form bonds. As we'll talk about later, we are neurobiologically wired for connection. And so it kind of becomes this glue that holds us together and our friendship just keeps having these bits of glue and we get closer and closer together the more life experiences we share and I know in 2020 it was um, more difficult to be around people for many reasons and so maybe that in-person friendship couldn't happen and I know that being in person with someone is the best way to experience friendship and I know that social media is not a replacement for that But if we have to navigate 2021 with some of the same confines that we had in 2020, then we need to use social media to our benefit. We do need to check in with people. We do need to post something that brings some humor and laughter to people. We do need to text and reach out to people more often. And you know what's great is that we have all these apps that we can video chat with each other. So no, we're not in person, but use those things that we can still see each other. There's so much communication that happens with our facial expressions. Use those apps and those video platforms where you can see the other person and smile and laugh and see their life and hear what's going on. You know, friendship and camaraderie are a little bit different than forgotten healer number seven, which is vulnerability. I know you may be thinking vulnerability sounds like an odd thing to be a forgotten healer, but it is amazing. Hopefully you'll understand it more when I explain it. Think about the synonyms for it. Defenselessness, weakness, susceptibility. Now these things could point to physical weaknesses, such as defenseless against another human or nature, but there is an emotional component to that as well. We don't like to be vulnerable emotionally. We do not like not having it all together and not looking like our life is all together. And there's this perfectionist component that a lot of people have and we want to present. But that is not life. Life is messy and full of imperfections. Some feel shame over their imperfections and some seem to fully recover and keep going forward. Brene Brown has studied vulnerability for like two decades, I think. And she started because she was a social worker. She started because she wanted to study connection. And then she started realizing um, that connection, she knew, is why we were here. It gets what gives us purpose and meaning to our life, she says. But she also began to see something that came out of connection was disconnection. And this shame over things and being disconnected from people because what they had done and they pulled back. And there was a shame component that came out and she started looking at that. She says shame is really easily understood as the fear of disconnection. So she went from studying connection to finding shame. And then she found a group of people who experienced things in life but didn't feel that shame. And you had some people that experienced some things in life and felt that shame. And that really kind of rocked her world, as she talks about. And she was labeling the file folders of what she would call this group of people that didn't feel the shame and what she would call the people who felt the shame. And she said that um, she realized for these people that they were wholehearted, that they could open up and tell their story without fear, and they could tell their story and still feel that they were worthy of love and connection. She said that was it. They just believed that they were still worthy of love and connection, even with these flaws and these imperfections. That was kind of interesting for me to hear um, and read about. It's a She's written quite a few books and has some podcasts and stuff, but it was neat to know that we're wired for connection, but we also need to be authentic and vulnerable with each other. And that leads to good things. That should lead to good things between us and others. You know, we don't need to shame other people. We need to um, listen to their stories. She says that they were courageous to still tell their stories. She looked up the word courageous and in the English language when it came in, it's from the Latin word cur, which means heart. And the original definition was to tell the story of who you are with your whole heart. 
She says, and so these folks had very simply the courage to be imperfect. They had the compassion to be kind to themselves first and then others. Because as it turns out, we can't practice compassion with other people if we can't treat ourselves kindly. And they were willing to let go of who they thought they should be in order to be who they were, which is what you have to have, absolutely have to have for connection. She said the other thing they had in common, they fully embraced vulnerability. They believed that what made them vulnerable was what made them beautiful. They didn't talk about vulnerability being comfortable, nor that they talk about it really being excruciating, as she had heard in the shame interviewing. They just talked about it being necessary. And this is something that I didn't expect for her to say about or to come about of her research, but I want to share it with you. She says, I know that vulnerability is the core of shame and fear and our struggle for worthiness, but it appears that it is also the birthplace of joy, creativity, of belonging, and of love. She says we live in a vulnerable world, and one of the ways we deal with that vulnerability is that we numb. But she says, this is the, the point I wanted to make, she says we cannot selectively numb emotions. When we numb the painful emotions, we also numb the positive emotions. If you trade your authenticity for safety, you may experience the following. Anxiety, depression, addictions, rage, eating disorders, blame, resentment, and inexplicable grief. Which leads me to number eight, journaling and pondering. If we are being vulnerable with other people, one thing we should do is really be vulnerable with ourselves. Just like she said, be kind to yourself and then you can be kind and compassionate with others, but you have to have that with yourself first. Journaling pondering does that. When I interviewed a young adult not too long ago about recovering from trauma, one of the things that they said was journaling really helped. As I probed a little bit more, they basically said that it slowed their thoughts down. And it was as simple as that. And I thought that was so interesting. I, I mean, we know journaling does that, but what you have to think about is, unless you're in the medical field, you have to slow down to write. <laughs> we tend to write fast and messy. Um, but you have to slow down to write. You know, honestly, you do wanna read what you're writing there. And so um, you wanna go back and look at it one day, but you do, you slow down and you write, and it forces you to think about what you're writing, but it also forces you to think, am I stuck in the same loop right now? Am I saying the same things over and over again as I keep writing? So it's like having something on a piece of paper and you can see it as clear as day. I remember one time I asked a dietitian to look at my diet for me. He was doing that at the long-term acute care. He was doing that at the long-term acute care facility I was working at at the time. And he said, sure. He said, why don't you do this for me? Write down what you eat for a week, everything you eat and drink for a week, and then get with me next week when we come in for treatment team. I said, thank you. I didn't hardly have to talk to him much because after I filled that out, I realized on when it was in black and white in front of me, I realized a few things. I did not drink as much water as I thought I did, and I did not have enough vegetables in my life like I thought I did. I would have told you I had plenty of water and I ate vegetables, a very good amount of vegetables. I did not when it's on paper. So journaling can do that for you. It can let you see what you're doing, even if it's over days. And if a month later you're still writing about the same things, it makes you ponder, why? Why am I stuck? You know, even, and we call this um, pondering probably mindfulness now, um, but there's journals where you can color. If you don't like coloring, there's um, words and phrases and scriptures and positive um, inspirational quotes that you can uh, write in their open letters and you can color or write in the middle of them. You know, just something while you're thinking. And then all of a sudden you realize, I want to write something now, or I want to think about something differently. You can journal it or you can just ponder it. But that silence and that slowing down is the birthplace of creativity. Now, yes, we can have inspiration on the go. It happens. But sometimes when we go from, from busy activity to the next busy activity to the next task to the next task, still remembering what we didn't do yesterday and still need to get done for tomorrow, there tends to be less time for creativity and problem solving and pondering. And we do want to ponder things in life. We want to ponder our goals. We want to have some intention in front of us, not just going from one busy task 
to the next busy task, et cetera, et cetera. So pondering and journaling is a great thing to do. Some synonyms for pondering is contemplating, introspection, examine, mull over, reflect, evaluate. The opposite of pondering is to overlook or discard, disregard, forget, ignore, or neglect. Once you start doing this journaling and pondering, you should have it as just a normal outflow of your daily life. And then it gets easier to do it when you're not actually just sitting down journaling and pondering because things can come to you because again, just like breathing, you're in the flow of it. You're used to journaling and pondering. You're used to, or just pondering, I guess, but you're used to that. And so your brain goes to that. Our brain likes to filter and to ponder. It really does. You know, at night, your brain does some pondering as well. It does some filtering and um, filing of the events of the day. Which leads me to the next forgotten healer, number nine, rest and sleep. Sleep, the way I explain it to sometimes when I'm working with children with behavioral issues and I'm talking to the parents, I do talk to them about sleep because sleep is so important for daytime behaviors. If you do not rest and and repair and get a good night's sleep, then you're irritable the next day. But again, like I said in nutrition, you have to keep going. And so it's even harder on a child. Their brain and their frontal lobe is not fully developed where we make you know, judgment and reason and cause and effect. And um, so they have a harder time pulling in and reining in those behaviors during the day. So one of the first things I talk about with those parents is let's talk about sleep. Let's talk about how to initiate sleep. Let's talk about lighting. Let's talk about mood. Let's talk about all these kind of things for them. And we problem solve a lot about sleep because that helps for the day. And um, sleep and rest are not the same. So when we talk about sleep, that gives us a good balance for the next day. But rest can happen during the day and it probably should. We should have rest breaks. During a typical work day, we have a 15 minute rest break during those first four hours of work. We have a 30 minute lunch break, and then we have another 15 minute break during the last four hours of work. And so, so work cannot just continue and continue without a rest break. I remember one time we were at a um, treatment team meeting or I was at a treatment team meeting and somebody came in and said, man, there's just been a lot going on. Um, and we all kind of looked around and many of us felt drained of some situations. And I was kind of new to the treatment team. And um, they said, you remember what that time that we all put our heads on the desk and rested for 10 minutes and A couple of them were like, yes, I remember that. That was great. And they said, let's do that again. And I'm like, what are we fixing to do? Like we (laughs) have all these healthcare professionals around a room um, for treatment team to talk about the patients and make decisions for them. And they set the timer and we all put our heads down on the desk and, and just sat there in total silence. And of course, I didn't have a clue what was going on. And I tend to... Um, not take rest breaks during the day. And so laying my head on the table, I started counting the seconds. I didn't know what else to do. After I got to about 180 seconds of counting, I decided that was, that was just nonsense. That was just silliness. Just stop. And I just rested. It was difficult. It was awkward. But that timer went off. Everybody picked their head up off the table and said, that was great. And we went on and were very productive. It was amazing. When I was telling this story to a man, an older gentleman, he right away said, actually, well, I was doing a webinar called Mental Health Breaks for Increased Clarity and Productivity. And I was telling him about that in that webinar. And he right away comes back with the story and says, oh, yeah, he goes, I know these old men that be working on something, you know, in their garage or in a car or something. He said they were working on something. They can't figure it out. He said, they'll say, hey, let's go take a coffee break. They'll go make a pot of coffee, drink their coffee, come back, they'll solve the problem. And I was like, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. (laughs) They didn't need to read about it. They just knew that they needed to not keep beating their head against the wall, looking at the same thing over, over and over again, and stop, take a mental health break, which was their coffee break. They came back and got insight on the problem. The last forgotten healer, number 10, is... Mindset and conscious language. It kind of goes back and encompasses a few of the forgotten healers I talked about before. Journaling and pondering would be one. 
Again, you know where your mind is, you know what you're ruminating on, you know what you're thinking when you're journaling and pondering. Because mindset really holds the key for so many things in our lives. If we think those negative thoughts, like I talked about earlier, then we tend to have negative things, negative chemical reactions in our body. Even with nutrition, we want good nutrition so that we feel better and we feel creative and we feel happy and we say happy things that we spontaneously have the energy to go help somebody or to give to someone and think about a gift for them. Do you see what I'm saying? Those things all kind of go together. But you really want to watch not only your thoughts, but your friendship as well. You want a set of friends that when you're going through things in life, they are speaking life into you. We want our ears to hear uplifting, um, life-giving thoughts and words. Um, Yes, they can be there to help us solve problems, but anybody can find problems. It's being able to see the problem because a problem is a problem. If my car is broken, my car is broken. I can't not call it a broken car. I've got to call it a broken car. Um, or whatever it is, but I want someone to come in my life that helps me solve that problem or be creative until I can solve that problem. And sometimes when we're in a stressful situation, we get in a zone and we can't think outside the box. It's just normal. We think that same way over and over again, and someone else comes in and thinks for us, not thinks for us, but helps us think in a different way. And so having people around you that are uplifting, that are positive, that want to help you solve problems in life is a great thing to happen. It's a great thing to have for your own thoughts. That also goes into your words. Because if you, you know, the old adage, if you squeeze a lemon, you're going to get lemon juice. If your thoughts are negative, maybe your words will come out very critical and negative as well. But if you're a person who looks for the bright side, who looks for the way to solve the problem instead of just staying in the problem, then your words are going to be in that same vein and they're going to be wanting to solve problems. You're going to be wanting to look how to make your grocery shop, um, look how to make your grocery shopping better so that you get better nutrition. They're going to be looking into, let me go find a book so I can start journaling and pondering. Let me go look for something that speaks to me on, does it have lettering or coloring? What kind of pages does it have? Your mindset and your thoughts are, should be an outflow of your life. I love this quote by D. Martin Lloyd Jones. The passage is much longer, but he says, stop listening to yourself and start talking to yourself. What he was saying is that, Basically, if you're listening to these same negative thoughts over and over again, or these what ifs and what ifs and all this stress behavior, he says, then you're listening to yourself and it's not going to turn out well. He says, start talking to yourself and say what you need to say. It's saying those positive things in your life, saying things that may not seem like the situation that's happening right now, but you know good's going to come out of it. And your friends are there to help you think that same way. So mindset and conscious language can play a big part in how you feel and how your physical and emotional makeup is as well. So here we are at the end of the Forgotten Healers. Obviously, there are many more, but these are some that I thought were important and really good to look at. And hopefully I've offered you some new insights on some that you may have already known. And maybe I've offered you a chance to learn something new today. But as I told you in the beginning, I'm going to give you tools on how to implement because there was 10 and that's a lot. And you say that may be a little overwhelming. Well, one of the first things that you can do is say which one resonated with me the most when she was talking. Which one did I say, oh yes, I know I need to work on that one. I've been knowing I need to work on that one. Or yes, that one's key for me. I think that would help in so many other ways. Pick that one and work on that one first. Put it in for about a week or maybe a little bit more, but put it in until it's good and solid and then add another one in. Pick another one that you think you want to work on and then add it in and just layer and layer. Um, You may not get all 10 in your life. Hopefully you will. But think about it. If every one of these is impactful and has healing and restorative benefits, five out of 10 would really be life changing. That still be a very huge impact on your life for 2021 and the years following. At the beginning of this year, we may not know what all 2021 will bring to us. But I hopefully have equipped you today with some things that you can bring to 2021. 
and you can be more proactive instead of reactive. If you make those small choices and you just keep being steady and consistent with those small choices, then that changes your day, your week, your year, and eventually your life. If you have any questions, you can contact me at VondaFlu.com. Um, and I want to sincerely thank Zido for allowing me to speak today. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, a wonderful rest of your week, the rest of this year, and the rest of your years, which ends up with a changed, more holistic, proactive, healthier, and happier life. Thanks for joining me today. Thanks, Vonda, for such an amazing presentation. If anybody has questions for Vonda, they can reach her at vondaflu.com forward slash contact or right on her website at vondaflu.com. Now that there's a lot of restrictions on businesses and it's harder to remain in, in personal contact with clients, we wanted to quickly highlight the Zyto Remote System that can help you effectively and efficiently reach your clients anywhere, anytime. If you want to know more about the Zyto Remote System, you can learn more about this infographic at zyto.com forward slash marketing dash materials or even at zyto.com forward slash remote. It will have all the information you need. We want to quickly highlight our hand cradle special and it's good while supplies last. Buy one hand cradle, get one 50% off and it's no limit on quantity. If you want to learn more, go to zyto.com forward slash HC dash promo. Thanks again for joining us today. Our next webinar is February 3rd, 2021 at 10 a.m. Mountain Standard Time.